So the panel today is going to be talking about the entrepreneurship ecosystem building, new partnerships and models for job creation and economic growth. So you all are familiar with Amazon Web Services and you know that one of the things that we like to brag about is innovation happens when you can fail fast and recover. And I think if you look at the success of entrepreneurs and if you look at people inside of organizations who are innovative, one thing that they all have in common is they are willing to take risks, they're willing to try big, bold things, and when they fail, they look at that as an opportunity to learn and restart. And nowhere is that truer than with the innovators and the startups, the entrepreneurs that we have running on AWS. So each of our distinguished panelists today comes from a different and unique entrepreneur, uh, or entrepreneurial organization, and they are all going to have a different perspective on this. So I think you know we tried to pick those people who could best represent the different areas of entrepreneurism inside you know working with AWS on top of AWS and with the public sector. So I'd like to start off, um, and we do have the panelists uh, in, in order. Um, Melissa Bradley is the Managing Director of Project 500. She's also the Adjunct Facility Georgetown University uh, McDonough School of Business. Andre Pinar is founder of C5 Capital. Dr. Sarah Staten is Senior Coordinator, Global Innovation Through Science and Technology Initiative at the U.S. Department of State, and Seifer Gresham is the VP of Communities, Seedspot, Adjunct Professor, University of Maryland, Smith School of Business. So we're gonna hear from these four panelists today. I'd like to start things off, though, going down the line, having each of you start with a two-minute introduction of who, you know, basically, what your role is in entrepreneurship and what you think this audience would be interested in learning from you today. Great. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you, Stacy, for inviting me. And, and I'm proud that I got through with you uh, with a little bit of assistance. Uh, my name is Melissa Bradley, and I'm honored to be on faculty at Georgetown University. Uh, I teach business students as well as Master of School of Foreign Service students about impact investing and social entrepreneurship. Um, I train about 200 students a year, and it's very interesting to have graduate students who are coming out of the professional world thinking about what is the role of entrepreneurship as they move forward, particularly with mass automation and other opportunities that don't make their corporate lives as secure as they used to be. I also have the privilege to run Project 500, which is a business accelerator here in the District of Columbia, and we do the D.C. metropolitan area all the way up to Baltimore. And we specifically target what we call new majority entrepreneurs, so entrepreneurs of color, African American, Latino, and Asian. And they are tech agnostic, so some are tech companies, some are tech enabled, and some have no tech whatsoever. But the idea is how do we accelerate new majority entrepreneurs who typically are excluded from traditional ecosystems? Hispanic businesses are the fastest growing businesses in the country, and African American female entrepreneurs start businesses six times as fast as a traditional white entrepreneur. So we have a captive market here in DC that we're excited to support. Thank you, Andre. Well, it's a great privilege to be here today, and thank you to Doug and to Stacy for um, arranging this panel. Our theme is a very exciting one because the number one challenge that governments around the world face is how to create enough jobs, and in particular, how to create enough jobs for young people, and how to accelerate economic growth. <coughs> Globally, we're at a time of um, unprecedented opportunity for entrepreneurship, uh, really driven by um, the innovation that's coming out of cloud computing. Cloud computing has not only transformed uh, how we do venture capital, but it's also transforming the opportunities for, for entrepreneurship. Historically, when um, venture capitalists look at very early stage investment opportunities, there were so many unknown unknowns and so many risks associated with the technology business. Today, with the majority of new startups launching on a well-known cloud platform, uh, and the majority of them in the US market on the AWS cloud platform, we have so much more visibility to make very well-informed investment decisions very well-informed decisions about how we can support entrepreneurs uh, than was previously the case. Secondly, what we find is that cloud is displacing capital with technology. 
And so less capital today is required to scale a business than has historically been the case. In the past, to get to about 10 to $20 million of revenue, you would have had to invest a multiple of that for a period of time before you can begin to hit those targets. And today, exactly the reverse is the case. You can get to $10 million with two and a half to $5 million of venture capital. Uh, and that's reflected, I think, with a growing appetite for this um, as an asset class worldwide. Last year, about $155 billion worldwide invested into venture capital, with the U.S. still very much the lead in this field and setting the example for the secret source that enables us to create new companies and bring new products and services to the market. So C5 is very excited to be able to build on this opportunity worldwide in partnership with with AWS and also with our colleagues from SAP NS2. I see one of my colleagues here in the audience. We run an accelerator in Washington, um, <clears throat> which is very unique worldwide. It's the first and the only one of its kind. It's in partnership with a small congressionally funded US government agency called the US Institute for Peace, which has as its mission to prevent conflict and to mitigate conflict worldwide. The US government is the only government in the world that has an agency that's dedicated to peace and to building peace. Uh, and our accelerator brings together entrepreneurs from all over the world, many of them from conflict countries, who bring new solutions and products to the market using the power of um, the Amazon Cloud and the SAP HANA platform to scale these businesses to help build peace in their communities and, and in their countries. And this is a mission which we feel um, very passionate about and very committed about and it's a very good example of how cloud enables us to find new solutions and new applications for real world problems. Uh, and we're delighted to be part of it. Thank you, Andre. Dr. Staten. Um, so I echo Andre's thanks for Stacy and Doug and AWS and private partners around the world. Uh, you might be asking yourself what the State Department has to do with entrepreneurship. Um, I'm a scientist by trade, and I feel very passionately about the Global Innovation Through Science and Technology Initiative, which partners with the private sector, with universities around the world, to be able to ignite scientists and technologists to be able to get out of the laboratory, out of behind their computer, and be able to create startups in 136 countries and territories around the world. And by partnering with groups like AWS, we're able to be able to provide that transition between the extensive networks that the State Department has by having embassies and consulates around the world and taking those individuals with all of that wealth of thought and expertise and provide them opportunities by pairing them with the private sector that can really help catalyze uh, their businesses and provide additional markets and opportunities for American companies and companies around the world to, to see stability. Thank you, Sarah. Seifer? Yeah, um, thank you all for being here. Um, it's really because of you all and the interest in building entrepreneurial ecosystems that we're able to uh, support more and more entrepreneurs. But why do we care about supporting entrepreneurs? And why, do we, why does SeedSpot do the work that we do? Well, in the US, since 1977, entrepreneurship is down by 48%. And to Melissa's point, it's not equitable in opportunity for individuals that have the opportunity to actually start the ventures. At the same time, the problems that we're facing globally are, are, are really huge, from equal access to education, to healthcare, to, creating, uh, to mitigating climate change. And at SeedSpot, we're on a mission to educate, accelerate, and invest in entrepreneurs that are forwarding positive social change. Um, and we do that through a variety of different programs. SeedSpot Communities, where we empower local ecosystem builders to run our two unique programs, our two-day launch camp to help on-ramp as many entrepreneurs that, with lived experiences to solve the problems that they identify in their community, oftentimes uh, with uh, being tech-enabled or not being tech-enabled or having technology as the core. Um, and then we have our eight-week impact accelerator that really takes the most scalable solutions and provides them with uh, the networks, the resources, the mentorship to really make a lasting impact on their community and scale their impact up to multiple other communities. We also run SeedSpot Schools, which where we train uh, local high school and middle school teachers to teach social entrepreneurship for the next generation to help be, to be empowered with 21st century skills and bring in technology and mentors to help them prepare for the jobs that, that don't exist today but will exist in 10 years. 
Thank you, Sefer. So I'm going to start with a round of questions, but I would encourage you to be thinking of yours while I'm asking the first few. Um, Sarah, I'm going to start with you. So the mm -hmm. Kauffman Foundation defines entrepreneurship as an ecosystem. And that is bringing in all the different components. It's bringing in public sector, private sector, social sector, into this community that's doing innovation. What is the government's role in stimulating this community of innovation? Right, so I think that the government is uh, definitely a part of this ecosystem, whether people kind of appreciate that or not. Government choices as far as regulations, the existence of bankruptcy laws and protection, these are definitely aspects where the government has a very strong role to play in the ability of startup and startup culture to be able to flourish in a community. And, and the role that we see the government, uh, the State Department specifically, being able to play in this space is by bringing players together. Um, the government has the ability to get people together in the same room and to be able to have a conversation that isn't always necessarily going to happen on its own. We're able to tap into the resources of American business, we're able to bring in foreign governments, and that can have very serious and beneficial outcomes. I mean, there are definitely countries that I've worked with that had uh, debtor's prisons that if you went bankrupt, you would go to prison. That through conference, we've been able to, to get them to kind of look at those regulations and to reform. Cool. Wow, thank you. Uh, that's tough, bankrupt and prison. <laughs> and definitely an impediment to getting people to take that risk, yeah. right? That is not the environment we're trying to create. Definitely. Okay, uh, Melissa, next question for you. So high tech growth startups are the ones that tend to attract the most attention, but it's the brick and mortars that create the most jobs. So how do we change the way we look at innovation to be inclusive, not just of the tech startups, but entrepreneurship in the brick and mortars? So we were pretty specific in DC in our recruitment to not just look at tech companies. Um, one, because we realized particularly in communities of color, for a variety of barriers, that's not their primary focus. Um, entrepreneurs tend to do things they're passionate about, they tend to seek opportunity, and I wanna be really frank but supportive, DC is trying to be a tech hub, but it is by no means Silicon Valley and we are not resting in Virginia uh, yet. And so we were clear that what was unique about the role of technology was its ability to scale, uh, its ability to increase efficiency, and its ability to bring on and, and disaggregate rote functions that allow people to upscale. And so we're pretty intentional that we don't really care what business sector you're coming from, but there will be a role of technology by the time you finish. So our sectors tend to be construction, tech and tech enabled, and professional services. And so what we found is the use of Amazon Web Services, how they're hosting, how they're taking in customer service, how they're doing project management, all those kinds of things are things they typically were doing manually or they were outsourced. Uh, so for us, we think it's important that our thesis is by investing in entrepreneurs of color, we are actually investing in increased employment amongst the new majority population. And what technology has been able to do is allow them to actually create more jobs, to create better skilled jobs, to create better paying jobs, uh, and to be able to scale their businesses. 60% of our entrepreneurs have increased profitability within six to 12 months upon graduation. And a lot of that is because they were just able to get themselves out the office. They were exposed to technology they didn't know exist. We were able to demystify where the opportunities were and how it could be part of the company and not take over the company. We don't sit with a lot of scientists who would be extremely scared, and I would dare say a little intrepid around what happens when you put things in the cloud. So we spend a lot of time helping them understand the technology is a tool and a means to an end, and it is one that actually helps facilitate what their overall mission is, which is to create jobs for their colleagues, for their peers, and for their community. Thank you. Seifer, Steve Case writes in the third wave, the next crop of disruptive companies is going to come from the rest of America. So what was Steve referring to and what does an effective entrepreneurship emerge in emerging cities look like? Yeah, that's a great question. So when you look at where traditional venture capital dollars have been uh, deployed, um, it really, really 75% of them go to three states, California, New York, Massachusetts. But we all know that smarts are not uh, distributed only in those three states. We all know that like the entrepreneurs that Melissa is working with in the US or that Sarah is working with internationally, those individuals have great learned experiences where they've been exposed to problems that individuals in those three, three states where traditional venture capital goes to have not even, been, have not even seen. So when, when Steve Case was looking at this, he was 
really looking at a, a investment opportunity where you can use Seek Alpha, and that really is about in the groups of entrepreneurs that are solving the problems that they're faced with every single day, and that they have uh, the opportunity to, to grow their ventures um, within those ecosystems. So what does a healthy ecosystem look like? Well, that's a much more complicated question than we probably have uh, time to really dig into this panel, but traditionally it's a, it, it focuses on multiple different sectors, everything from having uh, solid policies from government, a uh, capital uh, ecosystem that deploys capital uh, equitably to all entrepreneurs, not just to a certain subset, um, traditionally white men, um, if we know, and Melissa backed me up on some of these, these metrics here, but you know, majority of venture capital goes to white men. Uh, less than 10% go to female founders, less than 0.2% goes to African American uh, female founders. Yet to Melissa's point of like, look at the rate that they're actually growing. So having a really inclusive capital stack, but then having on ramps for those entrepreneurs and uh, program, programmatic support and technical assistance programs Makes it really makes a really healthy ecosystem uh, happen. Thank you, Andre. You represent the voice of the investor on our panel today, and uh, you know it's common knowledge that talent is distributed across the world, but capital tends to be focused in smaller areas. What is a is there a process that we can help make sure that that capital is invested where the talent is? Okay. I think that's a that's a great question, and I think. Um, in the comments from my fellow panelists, we've had sort of different strands of the processes that we have to start to make sure that capital gets uh, distributed equitably. And I think a focus on um, the focus on equitability and diversification is a is a major theme for all successful and sustainable venture capital investors today. The the traditional approach is just no longer sustainable, and I think. Uh, all the leading venture capital firms are, are beginning to, to realize that. And <clears throat> as part of that, I think we're also beginning to see from institutional investors and LPs much stronger emphasis on uh, social impact investing and making provision for, for social impact investing. But, <clears throat> but I want to give a shout out for the State Department because I think that <clears throat> the U.S. government is unique in, this, in, the, in the sense that it's trying to stimulate and support entrepreneurship worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, Government has a really important role to play in building successful entrepreneurial ecosystems. It's not state subsidies. Now, I'm hearing a lot of talk and discussions about how China is scaling venture capital. I want to be very clear, that's not venture capital. That's massive state subsidies on an unprecedented scale uh, to fund something which sometimes is innovation, sometimes is intellectual property theft. Uh, the US formula and the US model of a free market venture capitalism <clears throat> involves government setting clear policies, clear policy frameworks, and stimulating the ecosystem, animating the network that enables entrepreneurship um, and enables this process of making sure that the market is effective. We begin to diversify venture capital and invest it more, more equitably. And I've got the great privilege of having some of my colleagues from Bahrain here with me today. Um, three ladies who, who are uh, social entrepreneurs and um, computer programmers from, from the Gulf uh, who've come through our um, accelerator program there. We work very closely with the U.S. Embassy and the, and the State Department there. Uh, <clears throat> and in the Gulf, we see that uh, the majority of people coming into IT and into um, tech startups are female. And so um, worldwide, we're beginning to see trends change and, um, uh, and this issue being addressed. That's great news. And thank you for joining. <laughs> All right, who feels like talking today? Uh, this has been very interesting. I have more questions, but we'd love to hear what you're thinking. Does anyone have a question for the panel? Sure, there's a, a microphone right there. We are going to be walking around with a microphone too, but if you'd like to queue up behind that one, let's go with the first question. Minorityfinance.com. I'm also an adjunct faculty member at Georgetown. Before I get started, let me introduce my two interns, Mr. Yi, studying economics at Johns Hopkins, and Mr. Wusu, studying economics at uh, Franklin and Marshall, right? Uh, they're interning with me this summer. So the question is this. 
ICOs, blockchain, as a tool for getting capital to specifically African-American female businesses. We've been developing some tools in that area. I'm just curious. It's really interesting being here at Amazon and, and getting your opinion on the blockchain in particular and whether or not that's a, a tool that you can use to get capital. To the so, so I'll start with just a plug that we're actually bringing Brian from Kairos uh, here to DC in partnership with Stacy and AWS uh, in July to talk about that. I think that blockchain of itself, and I'm sure the State Department can speak, as a person of color, it has tremendous opportunity. But the disintermediation of who gets to decide whether I am worthy or not is an amazing opportunity. The ability to truly facilitate peer-to-peer -peer transactions is wonderful, and the ability to validate with mass migration internationally and hear that I have assets, it's an amazing tool. I think the challenge that we're seeing is that when I have entrepreneurs of color come and say we want to do that, there is a backlash against venture capital in terms of how do I even balance that? What does the cap table look like? What does my liquidity mean? And so I do think that in a silo, it has wonderful panacea of opportunity, but we've got to figure out how does it fit amongst all the other capital stacks because right now, at least here in the US, there has not been raises sizable enough to carry a company to an exit. Um, and I still think also from a regulatory perspective, there's some danger of, of what that looks like. But personally, as a professor who teaches this stuff, I am very excited about it. But no, we've got to figure out the regulatory piece, but most importantly, how do we partner with venture capital so they see it as a safe, comfortable, easy to partner with source of capital that actually expedites the role of entrepreneurs to get to scale into an exit. I think Melissa is absolutely right at the moment. What we're seeing is that most of the blockchain companies tend to be at a serious C stage, a serious A stage, a serious B stage perhaps, but none of them have really progressed to an exit. But this is a technology with tremendous opportunity. One of the startups that came through the Peace Tech Accelerator is called the Nona, and this empowers um, subsistence farmers all over Africa to sell their produ produce directly to Whole Foods and to Walmart and to all the big um, grocery producing uh, retail stores without any middlemen, clearing away any risk of corruption, clearing away all the, all the middlemen who've been taking fees off them and have been exploiting these farmers. And so that's just one example of how blockchain technology can really empower people. This is, this is a high potential technology. Yeah, I think to add, to add on to that just real quick is the potential of blockchain. Similarly, I've seen uh, a lot of innovation happening within the coffee industry, especially around blockchain that enables more transparency of the trade to, to enable not just the farmers, but actually the pickers and the different individuals that actually are creating value added services along the coffee supply chain, be able to leverage some of that blockchain technology um, to, to really have the end user, the end coffee consumer, be able to see where did all the dollars go when they're paying, especially for some of these third wave specialty roasters, you know, fourteen dollars to to twenty five dollars a bag of coffee. Where do the how does that how does paying more a premium for a really specialty coffee positively impact everybody through the supply chain? On the ICO, I'm really excited about it, but at the same time, uh, we definitely take a step back when we're at, when we're actually working with our entrepreneurs because of not only venture capital of how it's going to work at the cap table, but also just like the pure risk of of having an ICO. Uh, what happens if it's not tremendously successful? I don't know if you all watched Silicon Valley, but their <laughs> ICO went down in, in the show, and the, that, was, that was actually showing some of the dark side. It's not a panacea. Um, it has tremendous opportunity, but we have to figure out the regulatory environment first. And, and the last piece that I would add is, I mean, it is providing you know, a really interesting uh, kind of leapfrog step for a lot of these communities that don't have as many of these traditional uh, financial opportunities available to them to be able to gain access to finances in ways that they haven't pre previously been able to. Thank you, great discussion. I love it that there's a queue. Keep them coming. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Okoyemi. I'm from Nigeria. Um, I'm the CEO of DropQ, a startup that accelerates hiring processes for companies in emerging markets. Uh, we're actually part of C5's Peace Tech Accelerator, and that's really awesome for us. Um, my question is as regards um, funding for um, companies and startups in uh, places like Nigeria, where I'm from, where we don't have, um, we don't have the, the opportunity or the ease by which we can raise money through ICOs or through venture capital funds uh, because there's little interest in investing in those in those spots. I wonder if you can talk about that as well as 
uh, opportunities to, to gather funds. Thanks. So, um, so the, the, delighted to have dropped you in, in, our, in our current cohort in the PSEC Accelerator. Um, Nigeria is one of, of probably five African fast-growing African economies that's really driving the digital transformation of Africa. I call them the king's economy because it's Kenya, the Ivory Coast, Nigeria, Ghana, and South Africa. And what distinguishes all five of these markets is the access to undersea cables, which reduces data costs. Um, but um, my, my friend there is highlighting a very important challenge, which I think is a general ecosystem challenge, which is when ecosystems are underfunded, it's very challenging to, to uh, really create the right environment for entrepreneurs. At the moment, the total amount of venture capital that gets invested across 54 countries in Africa is about $250 million, which is about the same as the total amount of venture capital that gets invested in Italy. Um, so this is, a, this is a definite issue which we have to address. I think <coughs> cloud creates an opportunity to displace capital with technology um, uh, in two ways. One, uh, less capital is required to grow a firm, both in the home market but globally. But also secondly, what we're increasingly seeing is that where venture capital entrepreneurs are unfamiliar with a particular market or a particular country, they draw great reassurance from the choice of cloud platform. And so in a way, um, increasingly in venture capital, VCs are becoming very discriminating about which cloud platform, which software platform um, startups are being engineered on. And, and certain platforms are becoming marks of quality, badges of quality, and are uh, enabling venture capitalists to invest where they haven't invested previously. Um, and I think that's, that's another area that makes, uh, makes a big difference. And then finally, the World Bank, in partnership with the State Department, has launched a new program for supporting venture capital across um, the key uh, digital economies in Africa. And I think um, having multilateral institutions and having key governments, leading governments like the US government engaged will also help to make a difference. Kind of a lower level um, answer is that there's also smaller programs, whether it's through VC for Africa, uh, just actually has its own uh, investment piece as well because we work with over 600,000 entrepreneurs from around the world. Um, Melissa's actually worked with us uh, deploying these ideas of you can't scale if there is no money to be able to scale. You can create as many amazing startups as you can, but you need ultimately to have some external capital. And what we're trying to do is to mobilize individuals of high net worth or family foundations and other entities that have access to smaller amounts of capital, which may be more equivalent to a seed or a series A, um, and then to be able to help them get through some of the educational and due diligence issues to be able to invest in you know, technology and science startups, which is frequently seen as a scarier um, type of investment. All right, next please. Hi, good morning. I'm Thea Bornesi and I'm from Capital City Research right here in Washington, D.C. First of all, thank you so much. This is so helpful and the accessibility is, is terrific. Um, Mr. Seifer, Mr. Graham talked about how entrepreneurship is down 40%, which is a higher statistic than I knew. And then Ms. Stanton mentioned um, debtor's prison, which isn't so far off from what we would imagine as entrepreneurs, and I'm in a position of helping get capital for them. So while that seems far-fetched, it's sort of a real thing. And dovetailing on the gentleman's question before me, I guess brass tacks, maybe this would, this would be for Mr. Pinar. Uh, how much money does AWS, you know, how much has it funded you for your extraordinary efforts, and then Further, how do you allocate that money? So, so AWS hasn't invested any dollars with us, but they're a great technology partner. So AWS is, is providing uh, both uh, very valuable mentorship, very valuable talent, um, deep insight and learning about the use and the scaling of the uh, AWS cloud platform. And then also specifically for each of the startups, AWS is providing cloud credits which is in some ways one of the most valuable currencies today in the world because this is um, directly in enabling growth and innovation. And on those five levels, um, uh, the AWS investment in kind is of, of tremendous value to us in, in our accelerator. And alongside that, we have a similar contribution from uh, SAP NS2, who are again um, enabling entrepreneurs to use the HANA platform in a similar way, training, teaching, insights, mentoring, and talent. 
and it's making a big difference. And this is a program which AWS rolls out worldwide to accelerators. It's not specific to the BSTEC accelerator. Uh, and we'll have to ask Doug how much that totals up in the end, at the end of the day in your P&L. <laughs> but I, I know this is a very significant contribution to, to entrepreneurship. And I think entrepreneurs love AWS as a company um, and has a deep attachment to uh, the AWS brand because it's just such an enabling cloud platform. It's so easy to use. And uh, the AWS team is just amazing in terms of how they focus on entrepreneurs. I'm sometimes amazed how a big company like this can focus on, a, on, on one little startup in, in the amazingly supportive way that they do. Um. I'm going to second that. I just, the significant number of the seed spot companies that come through um, our different programs have been able to really scale up. And like, let's get down to the brass tacks. Like at the very earliest stages, this is when the, the founders oftentimes are sinking whatever savings they have into this venture. And anything to extend their runway is a lifesaver. And this is where AWS has been enabling our ventures through the credits to actually help extend that runway because they're not, they're, they don't have to spend the several thousands upon thousands of dollars on cloud computing power um, until they have some product market fit and market validation with customers. So they have, you know, starting to actually cre create cash flow into their companies. And now they're able to continue to, to yeah. move forward at the AWS. And we, and we, we, we call these cloud yeah. credits, but they're not really credits because um, AWS provide this to startups, yeah. but they don't expect anything back for it. Yeah. So this, this is not like loan financing. This is, this is, a, this is a pure innovation pure. investment, um, which doesn't go on the cap table, it doesn't go on the credit line. This is just pure enablement and support for startups. Yeah, and I can quickly say the, it's millions of dollars that we invest in startups, and it's not just the commercial startups. We have a program through TechSoup for nonprofits. So mm -hmm. any nonprofit that has you know, a certain operating budget, you know, we, we've targeted the smaller nonprofits uh, for that reason. You know, we don't want them to fail for lack of infrastructure, and that's one of our missions is to make sure that doesn't occur. And Andre put it well, um, these aren't credits. You, you, you don't repay them. This is a, a, a grant, uh, you know, for your cloud infrastructure. So, and, and I would just echo, in addition to, I mean, as phenomenal as the, the cloud services credits are, um, in addition to the hundreds of thousands of dollars of credits that we've been able to utilize and kind of distribute to, you know, the highest creme de la creme of entrepreneurs that we come across uh, around the world, we've also been able to connect the individuals. Um, so we run a, a global pitch competition that's hosted at the Global Entrepreneurship Summit. And the winner, Ajaita Shah of Frontier Solutions, she's doing last mile solar solutions. We were able to connect her with the managing director of AWS in India and provide her both mentorship and now they're working directly one-on-one. -on -one. She's becoming an AWS provider into that last mile and it's been tremendous. Her, her company has, um, you know, I think at least doubled in size since last I spoke to her and I think that that's a great way to show the synergies and opportunities as you be, you're able to partner these two pools of people together. All right, good questions. Keep them coming, please. Thank you so much. This is a tremendous panel. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Emma Strother. I work with Learn Serve International. We do social entrepreneurship training with middle and high school students in the Washington, D.C. area. And as we're talking about building out the entrepreneurship ecosystem, I'm wondering how you each see the role of entrepreneurship and particularly social entrepreneurship in K-12 education. I feel like that's uh, targeted at me. Um, <laughs> all good. Yeah, love, learn, serve. Um, they do a tremendous work in, in the DC metro area uh, supporting uh, K-12. So when really looking at the problems that Generation Z, the current middle and high school students, like what, what problems they want to solve and what they're very passionate about, we've all known that millennials are really about creating change to social issues and volunteering. But Generation Z is, uh, all signs point to that they're even more so than the millennial generation of being inspired by mission-driven companies and solving problems that they've been exposed to. Um, so what can we do uh, and why is it important? Well, one is because they're a future workforce and the jobs that exist today aren't going to exist in 10 years. That's uh, pretty, pretty well documented with the rate of technological change that's happening. Um, two is empowering them uh, with, with not just driving to the test type of uh, education, but actually training them on 
uh, 21st century skills, so leadership skills, collaboration skills, is hugely important. That's where social enterprise and social entrepreneurship really plays a key role. Um, and, and lastly, I just want to share a story about one of the high school entrepreneurs that we worked with in rural Arizona. Um, individual, he, he was jumped on his way home from work because he was in South Phoenix. Um, and you know, that really intimidated him from going to school. By going through the Seed Spot program um, in, in his high school, uh, he identified, you know, he was like, hey, why did I get jumped in this park? What, what led to the socioeconomic status and what led to the, the crime status of this area to, for me to get jumped? And after doing, digging into the root cause of the problem um, and digging into a few other ex extenuating factors, identified that, hey, it was because there was no lights in this park. And so a group of students actually created uh, Nightlight, K-N-I-G-H-T, Nightlight, uh, to create uh, low-cost ways to light up uh, public areas that are traditionally underfunded by local municipalities. And so utilizing chlorine, a uh, two-liter bottle, and small solar panel um, was able to put these nightlights throughout this park, and now uh, individuals are able to walk through that park and actually have um, some light. And that's the type of innovation that other individuals like that wouldn't have known about that park not having light and it being a dangerous place to walk through as a junior in high school. But because of that lived experience and the student being exposed to it, he was able to. And moving forward, he will always have that tremendous opportunity to innovate and address problems that he now sees um, in his communities throughout his life. I would just add to that. I mean, I think the issue is not so much what you're teaching from a skill, but from a mindset, right? I mean, to me, entrepreneurship is about a mindset. And the exciting thing about social entrepreneurship, particularly in the world we live in, is it teaches values. I went to Georgetown. We're all about care of personalis, care of person. And I think that's an understatement of what the world needs right now. Um, and I think once you step outside the United States where we have the luxury to solve for problems because I can't get a taxi exactly when I want it, where I want it, at the price I want, there are real problems, particularly beyond the walls of US and dare I say in certain communities. So I think the beauty of social entrepreneurship is allows people to expand their aperture of what is entrepreneurship. And it doesn't mean that I have to have a tech solution that's gonna go public or be sold in 12 to 18 months, which actually is not happening. But it means that I actually can find the, the wherewithal within myself without having a PhD to actually solve problems that I experience. I think one of the organizations that was probably a precursor to a lot of this was do something. It was $500 just to literally do something. It didn't have to be an organization, it didn't have to be fancy, and I do think that we have to demystify that to be successful in the world means you have to be wealthy. To be successful in humanity means you actually help someone and solve a problem, and so I think this idea of social entrepreneurs at a very early age is around culture, it's around values, it's around ethics, it's around your ethos, uh, and dare I say it's around cure personalis, which what we're seeing now of worlds being torn apart, in part because of technology, in part because of just complete misunderstanding of competition, that mindset, whether you start something or not, whether it's for profit or not, I think we definitely need to perpetuate that through schools, through churches, through synagogues, wherever we can, because that's the only way we're gonna make a shift and a pivot of where we are right now, where we're competing against each other for all the wrong reasons. Please. Hi, uh, my name is Noor. I'm um, one of the Nubile Prize winners for the competition. And um, my question is, it was mentioned um, earlier how 10% of venture capitals go to women. So I, um, how can we, what kind, of th what kind of things can we do to female students who study SME subjects uh, that can help them when they basically graduate and they're working in the fields? Working in the field of venture capital? Yeah, what kind of things can we do to help females to get more funding, basically? So, so it's less than 1% that go to women. Um, and, and I would say part of that is who's in charge. Um, I was a venture capitalist, and, and in the entire East Coast, there were only two of us that were women, and I was the only person of color during that time period. I think, one, there is much like social entrepreneurship, this belief that women don't do finance. Um, there were only two women in my finance class as a major at Georgetown, so I think one is demystifying what does it mean. I actually think two plus two is always four. American history tends to change, so I like finance. But I think one is helping people understand that finance is good. Um, I think the second thing is changing who's in leadership, and that's beginning to happen. There are several fellowship programs that exist all around the world, but particularly here in the U.S., 
that are looking at really a twist on emerging managers and really focusing on getting women. Um, Goldman Sachs just announced a $500 million fund that is both investing in women entrepreneurs yesterday, uh, but also a fund of funds to kind of put women on uh, as emerging managers. I think what we don't realize is that venture capital is often perpetuated because there was somebody in a firm who then got literally put on by another firm. If we're not there, we don't have that opportunity. I would also say that people who are exiting, and more entrepreneurs who are successful are thinking about that. So the Dennis family who have Sundial Brands who came out of Africa, went to Babson, started a massive company, was just acquired by Unilever. They're starting a $100 million fund specifically focused on female entrepreneurs of color. And I think it's important that one, morally, we're understanding this needs to change, but the numbers that I just shared with you speak volumes. 85% of purchasing decisions are made by women worldwide. We know that women outperform in terms of use of capital and return on capital. So the data is there. So I think the good thing is now there's not just a moral imperative, there's a reality that women control more money, women live longer than men, women make better decisions than men. There was this, I, I mean, I hate to tell you, uh, um, there, was this, there was research that I did for International Women's Day that said women who are on Wall Street actually outperformed when it came to the crisis better than men. And now there are people who understand that because of our size, because of our economic power, funds are being created, one, to support them because they create more jobs, but two, recognizing we have just as much power and probably better control and understanding of an investment thesis. And so now people are willing to actually invest in women. I think, let's be honest, venture capital is a long tail process, so maybe in 10 years the numbers will show. And now instead of one to two to three Zs, we'll have 10 to 20, hopefully in five to 10 years. And it's not a pipeline problem. No, I think it's just not. like full stop, we need to dispel that pipeline myth, and that's what oftentimes you you hear from venture capital is saying, "Hey, uh, I would invest if you showed me some." But it, if you look at how like the power structures of how deals traditionally have gotten funded, um, it's it's by individuals, it's by networks, and it's by individuals that you know. Oh well, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm I'm using this word specifically. Oh, this guy was referred to me. Literally, it's, it, it's about placing, it's like, oh, well, I know a guy, right? And so it's, it's about changing also the culture and how on-ramps are created to all funds and how it's not a network-based piece. And it's also changing the pure lexicon and nomenclature that uh, individuals use within the finance industry to say, in, instead of saying, I got a guy for that, it's about saying, no, no, no I know someone who's an amazing salesperson, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. saleswoman, sales individual. Mm -hmm. Although I will say, so it's not a pipeline problem from investment. I wish we would get more female VCs, though. Yes, but this 100%. issue of waiting 10 years to get paid is not as attractive as people think it is. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I want to echo everything that, that, um, that Melissa has been saying. I think the model for venture capital is changing dramatically. C5 is an example. C5 was started by entrepreneurs who had successful exits and then decided in the first instance to invest their own money mm -hmm. and then started to, in, to invite other people to invest alongside them. So. It's no longer a case of coming out of investment banking and leveraging other people's money. Um, <clears throat> it's now we see more and more entrepreneurs having successful exits and starting their own venture capital firms. And some of the most successful women-led venture capital firms we co-invest with have been created with this model. And I think that's going to be one of the key areas of change in the VC industry. And then second, I think, again, cloud is playing a major role in, in, in opening up the entrepreneurship ecosystem and making it more equitable. And AWS have a number of very active programs in this, in this area. Right, we have time for a couple more questions. I want to make sure uh, the keynote is immediately after this. So we'll go, uh, people in line, we'll, we'll go through and then we'll stop there. Just, just in time then. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this great panel. Mark Schleifer with an organization in DC called SIPE, the Center for International Private Enterprise. Um, so I just wanted to go back to that, that question earlier. Uh, you talked a little bit about blockchain and you know, potential uses around compliance and supply chain issues and uh, you know, greater transparency and corruption in trade. A related kind of e-commerce question. What, what about countries where just the infrastructure for digital payments is, is lacking or you know, just very, very rudimentary? Or even the supply chain itself, I mean, you know, people can't you know, entrepreneurs can make things, but they can't ship them, or you know, things can't get shipped into the country. You know, what what are some ideas, solutions in, in tackling that that you've seen that are that are interesting? I think um, the African continent is interesting because um, 
Africa has leapfrog technology, and so um, Africa is a leader worldwide in mobile money. So um, Afri Africa bypassed the traditional banking infrastructure and went straight to mobile money. And so today, um, more than 750 million people in Africa use mobile phones, and they do almost all their banking and financial transactions on mobile phones. And blockchain have been a very complementary technology uh, for mobile money on the African continent. Um, and anything that helps to build trust and verifies trust drives free trade and free markets. So um, <clears throat> I think where blockchain has more of a challenge is, 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 in the, is in the sophisticated developed economies where they've been traditionally readily available, a whole range of mechanisms to establish trust. And we see blo blockchain really flourishing in the markets where new mechanisms and new channels are being established to build and establish trust and transparency. All right, our final question. Excellent, thank you. Thanks everyone for, for joining. I'm Gideon Taub, the founder of a company called Pinkaloo Technologies, which is also affiliated with C5's uh, incubator. Uh, as to provide the entrepreneur's perspective for a moment, I can echo the tremendous value that, that AWS does provide from the entrepreneur's side. Both the credits, which essentially are as good as VC capital in terms of we know we're gonna use them Even and better. it doesn't hurt the cap <laughs> table. <laughs> but also the, the mentorship and access to systems architects. So we just did want to reinforce that from the entrepreneur side. Uh, the, the question I have for you, we've obviously been chatting a little bit about less investment in this part of the country than some of the other cities. What's one or two things that entrepreneurs could be doing better or could be doing differently uh, facing those realities versus what we see on a show like Silicon Valley or what we read in TechCrunch and some of those other uh, publications more focused on those primary markets? Thank you. So in three minutes, uh, um, number, number one thing is actually uh, that, that we see with entrepreneurs coming through our program is that being able to uh, have follow through and commitment to, uh, to working and setting goals for themselves. Um, you know, there are a tremendous amount of resources available in every ecosystem and ranging from AWS to accelerators to Project 500 to SeedSpot to C5 to to you know, programs that are deployed internationally. And the taking advantage of those resources, now part of it is do they know about those resources, which is a whole other topic, but then once they're in programs, is make sure that there is the commitment to fully taking advantage of those programs. Um, and setting forth goals, like while they're going through the programs, and uh, making those goals very transparently clear to the program leaders, so then that those program leaders can be best positioned to support you as an entrepreneur. I would say that at some point in time, if you start a company in this country, in, in those three places or elsewhere, at some point in time, you're gonna run across somebody who doesn't look like you, you don't know anything about them, and I would say, please be culturally competent. What people don't realize, when you start companies in this country, you can literally have a homogenous experience and never have to change who you are. But if you want to grow a company that will get acquired, you need to be global. And I am sick and tired of seeing American entrepreneurs go into countries and have no cultural competency, no understanding, and complete disrespect for how things work. And understanding the role of women, understanding the role of culture, understanding the role of education. What does it mean to be an African? If you come into my neighborhood, what does it mean to be an African American? And so I think that what many places don't talk about is how do you become culturally competent? It's not taught in school. We are taught that the, that the old majority is the way to go. We're taught that there are certain standards. But with dealing with people, there is no book. And I'm always disappointed when we see people boomerang back to our accelerator who've gone through the branded ones, that they do not understand how to maintain relationships. Blockchain is exciting because we have lost what it means to learn how to trust somebody, to have a conversation, to move beyond 140 characters. So I would say to any entrepreneur, please work on your communication skills. Please work on your cultural competency skills and please work on your relationship building skills because everything cannot be done through technology and you cannot sell a company by users. You can only sell a company if people ultimately trust you and are willing to pay for it and that's how they become users. I think relationships are key. Relationships are actually the most valuable thing that entrepreneurs have. It exceeds technology, it exceeds capital. Um, there's only one thing that's more valuable than relationships and that's time and, and good health. Um, I think the other very important thing to remember, entrepreneurs should remember is uh, entre entrepreneurship is hard, but unlike baseball, you can have three strikes and you're not out. Mm -hmm. Keep trying, <laughs> keep trying, keep trying. 
your entrepreneurship and your startup only fails when you decide to stop trying. So keep trying and build your resilience because there's always one other way, one other thing that you can think about that you can do to make your business sustainable. I, I think the last piece, obviously looking perhaps a little bit beyond our own borders, I'd say partner. You know, in addition to building those relationships and the competency is that there's a lot of opportunity to be had in the United States, I, I believe that absolutely, but there's also a lot to be had by partnering with people abroad. And the ability to grow through joint ventures is something that I don't necessarily see as many Americans outside of those traditional three communities taking advantage of. And when they do, I think that there will be a tremendous amount of growth and opportunity both in the exits and the, in the, in the capital that's in those environments. Um, but it can really benefit both communities extensively. Well, I would like to say thank you to our distinguished panelists. This was a great way to start this event today. Thank you very much.